Hi, I'm Laurie Higgins. I'm the Director of Community Safety and Digital Civility at Roblox. I'd like to welcome you to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, from, I'm going to be moderating this incredible panel discussion today. We're going to be focusing on creating inclusive content. Um, so at Roblox, our mission is to build a platform that enables billions of users to share experiences together. The Roblox concept of a platform of shared experiences is sometimes referred to as the metaverse. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. But essentially, it's about creating these persistent shared 3D virtual spaces in a virtual universe. Um, Roblox really is a new way for people to be together when we can't be together in person. It's a global community of people coming together to share experiences. And every day, millions of people come together to create, connect and explore millions of immersive virtual experiences together, all of which are created by the Roblox community. Having a healthy, diverse and positive community is everything to us and encouraging our developers to be mindful when they're making those experiences to make sure that the platform is safe and welcoming to everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be talking about this topic today. It's something personally really important to me. Um, and I know that it means an awful lot to, to the people who are using our platform. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having a deep conversation about this and going into a little bit more information, uh, sorry, into, into, into a bit more depth about this topic. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the panel. So I'm gonna hand over to Anat. Please, could you introduce yourself? Hi, sure, happy to be here. I'm the founder and CEO of Toya, an Israeli female-led studio. So we're based in Tel Aviv, but have a multinational team. And we focus on creating equal realms and gaming experiences for girls and boys. And we do that on Roblox. We have a couple of games released over the past two years. And six weeks ago, we launched the first adaptation for the animated series, Miraculous Ladybug. Amazing, thanks, Anat. Um, and can I hand over to you, Robin? Could you introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. <clears throat> My name is Robin Hanneke. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Phenomena here in San Francisco. Um, we've been around for about nine years now. And uh, we make games uh, that we think bring joy and creativity to the world. And we are also working inside of Roblox now. Um, we have a small environment there called Beanstalk, which is actually in alpha and are working on a few other projects inside this space um, that are currently unannounced, but we're really excited about. Um, I think that uh, my other sort of life when I'm not a CEO of a game company is that I am a professor at UC Santa Cruz and I am the founding director of the arts, games and playable media program there, which is now one of the fastest growing majors on campus. So I'm an advocate for young people making games and it's one of the reasons why I find Roblox so exciting. Amazing, thanks Robin. Um, and finally, last but not least, Ashley, would you mind um, introducing yourself, please? Um, hi. Name is Ashley, and I've been creating on this platform for about six years now, since I was 11. And I focus on making various games and avatar items with my um, girlfriend, Nicole. Um, we've started a business called Tailswipe LLC not too long ago, um, planning on registering it next year. Um, focus on creating opportunities for more neurodiverse and disabled and individuals such as myself and serving as a departure from harmful practices made in traditional industry spaces. One of the projects we're working on under this name is a large scale LGBT social space. Um, That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Ashley. I'm really looking forward to, to getting into conversation with each of you about these projects. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by inclusive content. So what do we really mean by that? I think perhaps if I can throw it out to each of you, just to kind of give me a bit of feedback when we say inclusive content, what does that mean to you? How about let's throw it to you this time, Robin, you go first. I think at Phenomena, we, we sort of define the idea of inclusivity as coming from uh, the imagination of as many people from the different walks of life as possible. So actually, it starts with where the content comes from. Um, you know, at the company, we're over 60% 
uh, people who identify as coming from an underrepresented group. So, you know, have tried to really build an environment where um, inclusivity is part of the everyday concern of the people that are creating the content. Um, and I think that when you get to some place where you can have open conversations about what a broad group of people want, then you're getting closer to building spaces that don't inadvertently exclude others. Lovely. Ashley, what does inclusive content mean to you? Do you have a kind of definition for that? Yeah, um, to me, it means sort of a body of experience, not just included various um, often overlooked minorities in the forefront of your projects, but something more nuanced as well, putting thought into how others of these various groups will interact with your content as, as well, and being sure to consider these different perspectives. Inclusive content should strive to make different people from all walks of life comfortable to explore and interact with what you've created. Brilliant, lovely. Anna, is there anything you can add to that? Not sure, actually, but just, you know, to say that I think that inclusion actually can mean different things to different people. So um, at Toya, I think that, you know, our mission is connected to creating greater inclusion for girls and women. And we think that Robux is the best place to do that. And what it means is that when we discuss the game design, we would say she and not just he. Most of the time, uh, when describing the end user, so sometimes you know it may sound like an insignificant nuance, but language I think is the foundation of the world when you know building and when using inclusive terminology uh, while developing a game uh, is reflected not only within the organization but also in the final game. So yes. Brilliant, thank you. Um, is there anything that you're particularly focusing on within your work that's related to this topic? Um, Robin, you're nodding. What, what, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I actually have a mug here for a game that we made called Luna. And in Luna, we made uh, the game is a fairy tale. It's all about um, different animals. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a game about recovering from trauma. So the sort of core narrative is about letting go of something that's a traumatic experience and letting yourself uh, move past something that maybe you're carrying around in your, in your tummy is kind of the analogy. But <clears throat> when we were working on the game, we removed all gender pronouns from the concept so that no one was ever talking about any of the characters specifically in a gendered way and made it so that you could identify with any of the animals in the, in the game um, as you or as someone you know, as a way of kind of creating more of a, of a dialogue around um, personal narrative and being able to project your personal narrative in the space. And since then I've really been um, sort of focusing a lot on how across games like Journey and then Luna, even with Tom, the ideas of the characters are really informed by this idea that you're not, you're not necessarily gendering them in your mind when you're making them. And uh, in my next game, I'm trying to see if I can build a really truly diverse and interesting environment where there's a single body type that you change um, by how you dress it and how it performs in the space, as opposed to the, the sort of core uh, components of it. So basically like the Sims one, building an entire experience on a single set of animated properties. So that's actually one of the, the big experiments I'm working on right now. That sounds really fascinating, Robin. Well, we'll see. Um, Anna, <laughs> is, there any, is there anything that's like really focusing you on this project at the moment, on this topic at the moment? Um, I think that, you know, with um, one of our uh, original games, like My Farm uh, on Roblox, like we aspired uh, to many and varied representations of farms. So from Asia and Africa and different countries in Europe, like Spain and Germany. And we wanted everyone to be able to choose the style of their farm from a wide and representative range and to manifest their personality in a manner that is free from you know, traditional anachronistic representations of farm. And the other thing we did uh, was to include NPCs of female farmers because looking at other you know, farm uh, genre games on Roblox, we just saw um, male farmers all over the place. And so we thought that this experiences could reflect different cultures and nationalities, which go beyond the American-centric representation. And so this is what we were doing uh, on with my farm. Um, Ashley, so I know you've been creating things within Roblox for some time. So can you can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about inclusivity and what you're focusing on right now? 
Um, well, my focus relating to this is simple, um, providing representation for marginalized and often overlooked groups, curating opportunities and spaces for us to thrive, and aiding and gradually shifting both online spaces and the general development workflow to be much more mindful of these issues, all things that are extremely important, but on the same token, what we're often deprived of. Growing up in plenty of these environments have really served to make this the forefront of my focus in the industry. I know how devastating it was for me to not have these various considerations widespread, and I seek to do everything I can to make sure these issues don't hold true with other individuals as well. Um, continuing with um, Robin's definition of, I think, a trauma-focused game, um, my first serious develops, um, albeit never fully realized project was Consomio, uh, which was a story game to express a lot of the struggles I've been through realizing my trans identity while traversing an extremely negative environment at home and otherwise. I plan to continue work on it in the coming years, this being one of my larger passions, developing experiences, hopefully resonating and helping LGBT youth who've gone through similar situations. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, all of those things are so important. And we've already touched on so many different themes about, you know, inclusion and representation. So I'm really looking forward to, to digging into some of those ideas a bit more. Um, <clears throat> so as I say, during this session, you know, we're going to explore what good representation looks like, why it is so important, and sometimes why it's really hard. You know, we've already touched on some huge topics there. We all want to make sure that these spaces feel safe and welcoming um, and that when people join places like the metaverse and online spaces that they're having a good time. So, you know, well, I mentioned the metaverse before. What does it really mean? I mean, it, as I say, it's a term coined in science fiction originally. It's now been used for decades, but we're only really starting to see it become a real thing now in the online world um, and particularly within platforms like Roblox. So, in essence, these 3D online spaces are where people can seamlessly move from one experience to another, taking their online avatar and identity with them, quite often taking their friends with them and going through all these experiences through entertainment like concerts and art galleries and fashion shows. They can do learning, they can do work in these spaces all in one platform. So really what we're doing is replicating the real world, but now online. Um, providing spaces like that that are really inclusive, we have to think way beyond safety. Of course, that's absolutely essential and that should be the first thing we think about, but then it's about building these other things around it. We want to make sure that every member of the community feels they belong, they have equity, and that they're represented. We all know if you don't see it, you can't be it. So, you know, I think what happens online is a real reflection of what's going on offline we are all facing huge societal issues right now that perhaps have become far more prevalent than before how do we start to address them so i think we're going to dig into some of these really big topics now um so what do we really mean um <clears throat> is it enough sorry to just translate languages to provide language support for different regions um how do we really make these games totally globally inclusive I'm going to hand that over to Anna. And um, I, I think that it starts for me with the team. So who's on my team that can think not who are they? Who do they represent? Because um, this would definitely translate to the experience they will be looking to create. And we know that the games industry have been like, dominated by a very male-centric uh, perspective for a long, long time. And I think that one of the key uh, metrics to changing that is comprising a team that has different age group that represent different you know, personalities, nationalities, genders, uh, in a way that will translate into the experience you're looking to create. I have no doubt, because I've seen it happening in, in Toya. Once you know you have a discussion and a brainstorm around the game and everyone can bring in their own a culture and personal experience, this will reflect in the experience you'll be looking to create. So, and it will al almost become like a non-issue. Uh, once this is like something you're accustomed in doing within your team and the discussions, really it does. It becomes a non-issue. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Annette. That's that's really fantastic. And and you know, I think that's something we can really think about, isn't it? Is just getting those shared ideas right from the beginning, right from conception is really, really important. So um we know there have been quite a lot of trends and developments in the gaming space all around diverse communities and creating inclusive content. What do you think game designers and developers should keep in mind when they're coming up with these new games or content or virtual items as you create, Ashley? Um, I'm going to start with you, Robin. Could you kick this one off, please? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what we've been sort of talking about, you know, in general is true in the specific as well, right? So vocabulary, figuring out how you're going to talk about um, yeah. the kinds of mechanisms that are in your game. So for example, we built a game that was a, a tower defense title and, you know, tower defense is a genre and tower defense is like you put a tower down and then you, you know, you defend your territory against enemies, right? And looking at the genre itself, you know, the team was really asking, what does it mean to just go someplace and put your stuff down and then take and take and take? Like, how do you decolonialize this narrative? How do you make it, you know, not racist? How do you make it inclusive? What's the kind of backstory for an environment um, and a game world where people could feel included by participating in this in this relatively, you know, command and conquer style gameplay that's been a hobbyist game uh, genre since the beginning of games, right? When you look at actually developing your, your games and looking at like what genres are popular, you have to kind of do a little bit of unpacking about the, the history of where these games come from. And most often they come from a military history and they come from a, a place where the people that were making them had access to computers because they were in the military industrial complex. So just actually starting there with like the definition of the genre. And then the other thing that we always try to do is think about what the user experience is that we really want. If you want to build a game that creates a feeling of joy or creativity, or in the case of Luna, a sense of letting go, then you really need to build that into every actual aspect of the game. So if at the beginning of the game, you're solving a puzzle, and then you're building out a world, and then you're going into that world to engage with the characters, you know, if everything leads to a moment where you're helping a piece of of trauma escape a character and go into the sky and become part of the moon, you know, that's the narrative of that game. Then you really have to be focusing all of your energy on that transformative moment of letting go. That's gonna be at the end of every chapter. And so really building the development beats around a shared language that takes away kind of notions of privilege or control, um, authority and so on. And then also building towards something that's different. And I think that, you know, this is, it, it happens on a team, but it, it, it happens because you make it part of the process. So you have to build a team where people feel comfortable saying, I don't really like this. This is a little bit like this example film that we're using, for example, for inspiration in the, in the boards is really whitewashed version of, a, of, a, of an Asian narrative. You know, all the characters in the film were white. I feel uncomfortable about that as an Asian American person or whatever. You need to build an environment where people feel safe to say those things. And I think what Anat and, um, and Ashley have talked about already is really about building an experience for people, but it comes from the people themselves. Yeah, no, fantastic. And I think having that healthy challenge from the people around you. That's why we hire these people. Isn't exactly. It, you know? Creative um, abrasion. It's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I identify with what Robin just said. I think it's about redefining culture uh, to some extent. Uh, I can give an example uh, of a discussion we had a while ago with a Christmas update we wanted to have in one of our games. And we were starting talking about Santa Claus and his wife. And we're like Israelis. It does not apply to us. So, and then we have like European members in the team. And so it does not apply to them as well. And so all kinds of winter math came up and we started like, it was like an incredible discussion where they were sharing a lot of, you know, their historical childhood stories and by the end of the day, this was all manifested into the Christmas update in a really, I think, spectacular way because it, it was like representing um, different lifestyles and mm -hmm. math um, that is, for me, expanding the experience yeah. of Christmas and this specific update. So it was like a win-win for me, like from all aspects, I would say, yes. Absolutely. And we can all keep learning of these things as well. You know, I think for us, it's there's a moment of growth there. It's really interesting. 
So we've kind of talked about advice for the developers or the, or the creators here, but what about the community? How do we create these communities that support the diversity? Um, how can we really showcase that work in general? How do we get it out there? How do we get people acceptant of this kind of change in the way that we want to create things? Anna, do you want to go first on this one? I, I think that, yeah, happy to. One, I think that one of the keys uh, to being able to support uh, diverse contributors is to make sure the community you're building is a safe space. So we take extra care towards minorities to ensure that their needs are met. Members who do not support minorities or who are disrespectful are swiftly removed from our community. And we ensure that, that we have admins who are approachable and able to help anyone who has issues. And there are like, I think many, uh, many ways to make everyone feel welcome. Um, some tips I can share are like, you know, have uh, clear rules, including a banning or blocking system and encourage people to express any aspects of their lives that they wish to express. And, and ensuring that your admin teams contains a diverse group of people can also really help everyone feel welcome. So I think that once the community feels safe and welcoming and it's demonstrated that diverse people are welcome, it becomes easier to start highlighting their own work. So yes, this is how we approach it with Toya. Brilliant, thank you. Robin, did you have anything to add on that topic? Yeah, I actually think that like uh, my experience building journey was was really educational here, uh, trying to build an online space where two people would be interacting with one another, but uh, you would not have any idea of their gender, their age, where they were playing from by uh, removing all the player data so that they were just an anonymous being. Um, you know, a lot of people had the experience of playing journey where they thought that that character was an AI and didn't realize they were playing with multiple people over a period of, of levels. And then at the end of the game, we're really blown away by the sort of screen that showed how many partners you had played with. And it, it really it really showed me a, a couple of things. The first, the first few things were really about structurally how you build the design of a game, um, especially how you build communication systems inside a game has a, a huge in, impact on the tone of the experience. So if you go to a, a, a house party, at a random house that, you know, a friend of a friend says, oh, someone's having a house party. You go, you show up. There's a ton of anxiety around who's going to be at the party. If, am I dressed appropriately? You know, are there going to be activities at the party that I want to do? Are there going to be things there that I don't like? Like lots of illegal drugs or a ton of dancing, which makes me anxious, right? And like putting yourself in that situation is a huge it's a huge burden, especially for someone who's not neurotypical and I am not. So like, you know, as someone who has anxiety about going to public places that I don't understand, when I think about what would make a community accessible, it's that I can show up without being on. I can choose the environments that I'm in and I get to contribute when I feel comfortable. And like, there are some really great papers. Um, for example, Project Horseshoe has a paper on online relationships and the way that people develop relationships. The Sims community has, has done a lot of work in the space. Um, there's a history of designers developing online spaces where they really ask, what are the levers that I have to pull right away? And do I have to do it? As soon as I show up, do I have to perform? And I think asking those kinds of questions is important. And then the other thing is, Again, we have built a lot of games that are about conquering. They're about being uh, king of the hill. This is like a, a huge genre inside of, of Roblox is the players that want to be king of the hill. You know, you can say queen of the hill, but in the end that implies a hierarchical structure and winners and losers and really asking yourself for something like, like a game like Journey. But what's a way that I can interact with other people that implies no power, that is reciprocal, and reciprocated at will by the other person. And so, you know, for example, I can't talk to them, but I can sing to them. Well, when I sing to them, they glow and they can fly. So they get a benefit and I get to hear a beautiful sound. Like that's a reciprocal sustaining and mutually fulfilling relationship. I think these are the kinds of things you have to ask yourself when you're building a community from, from day one. What are the levers and do I have to 
perform right away. Because if you throw people into these experiences, no matter where they come from, they're going to feel anxiety. It's going to impact their experience. And in the long run, it's going to make them feel less safe, regardless of whether you're really explicitly thinking about minorities, women, trans folks, queer folks, you know, people that are differently abled. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I think, yeah, all of it needs to be organic and a gentle process to, to get people in it, to really immerse themselves. So yeah, I love that. Ashley, I'm going to come to you with a very slightly question, a slightly different question. So I'm thinking more about the community and the feedback that we get from the community. Um, you know, is it, is it helpful to get that feedback from the community that you're trying to reach? What's helped you with your Roblox community, Ashley? Um, I mean, I absolutely can't stress enough how important feedback from marginalized people is. Way too often have I seen, you know, bigger um, beginner creators come in both on and off the platform left to consider if their game's content is accessible to a wider audience, um, disabled and neurotypical individuals especially. As a direct result, this ends up both alienating a good portion of your audience and severely, severely limiting the reach. Things that could easily be figured out by both research and consulting and reaching out to your audience to make sure your content is as accessible as possible. There are plenty of people you can ask for feedback while making content. Those with colorblindness, low motor control, and neurodivergent individuals are all great places to start. It's important to also remember that not everyone experiences disability the same. One colorblind person may have trouble seeing certain colors and another may have trouble distinguishing them. Everyone's unique, which is why these groups are important. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's such a good point. And, you know, there's a, the flip side, I guess, is that the more of these things we can do, the more we're having those conversations, the more we can help people who are not experienced those things to understand that there are so many nuances right. that it's different for everybody. You know, we can all sit here and say, oh, I know what color blindness is, but we don't unless you experience it. So to, to try and have somebody share their personal experience with you and perhaps a variety of those experiences, I can see that that would be really helpful in getting people to really understand and also that representation topic as well. Um, what about you guys? How, you know, do you get feedback from your communities? How, how do you manage that? Anna, I'll throw it to you first. Um, I think that with Roblox, um, once you feel like you're the community, it means that you're on your way to success to the extent that you have successfully found the team that is the community and reflects the community. Um, but it's not just about that. I think that for us, it was also about successfully creating a process where the community is involved from the beginning. So on our Discord channel, there are like thousands of girls, boys, non-binary who are constantly, constantly playing our games and we share every feature and every new character and every idea we have. So on a weekly play test, and then our community manager, you know, invites everyone who wants to join and give their feedback. And there's like a conversation of like sometimes two hours a week of what they think we should add and how and why. And so it's like super relevant, uh, super interesting. And a lot of that feedback is being taken back and implemented into the process, even a lot, a lot before the game is released. So I think that this is a part of, you know, working with being a part of the community, for sure. Brilliant. Now, Robin, I know that you engage with the communities because I saw you speak at our Roblox developer That's conference right. a couple of years ago. Um, and I know, you know, a lot of our, of our developers just were desperate to come and talk to you about the stuff you've been working on. How else do you do it outside of Roblox? How, how do you engage with your community and what sort of feedback do you get? So we have a pretty active social channel outside of Roblox. Um, we get a lot of we get a lot of feedback from the user community and user reviews. If you go to like our Steam page, especially for games like Luna, which have um, they reach a certain community, like they're built for that community. Like Luna was not built to be a AAA blockbuster; it was built to be um, a conversation point for people that are struggling in some way and need a chill, kind of cool, 
easy place to kind of be um, and, and experience themselves and, and have some time with themselves. And I think we get a lot of feedback um, on those channels. And I think one of the things that's really important to point out is that as a developer, especially if you're established and you've been in the community, like I've been making games for almost 20 years and my first product was The Sims, you can really get a sense of how a dialogue with the community about like what Annette is talking about, you know, like about what the features are, what would you like to see? How would you like to engage with this product as you move forward? Like if you could add anything like to this expansion pack, what would it be? You know, and they'll always say, oh, snow, which is of course a really difficult thing to add to a game. You have to add it to every asset, right? So, you know, you, you learn to have a dialogue with the community, not only about what their wishes are, but also about the development itself. And it's a teaching moment. Like you're building within the community, as you discuss with your, your players and your co-creators, you're building a sense of shared ownership, but you're also letting them know like what the limitations are, what, what, what the prioritization schemes are, how we make decisions, how, how, how development takes time. And as, as people get more educated about games and gaming spaces, um, they become more interested in becoming a co-creator or co-imaginate imaginer or like uh, a visionary in your space and you really you're really giving them the opportunity to feel involved in a way that is it takes it takes it to the next level like they might be inspired to to build their own space in Roblox or to to pick up unity and try something new and in my mind a world where more people are building interactive material that expresses their own perspective is a world where more people can engage with others' perspectives and learn what does it feel like to be differently abled in this way or this way? What does it feel like to, to feel isolated in this body or to move to a new country and try to be at home by uh, eating different foods that you miss? You know, like when you look at some of the content that's being released right now, especially in VR, there's a huge opportunity for the audience to become the creators themselves. And I think it's really important for us as established developers to to engage with that and build bridges and, and skills. Brilliant, thank you. And that is the perfect segue to my next question. We've talked a bit about what you can do as the creators yourselves. We've talked a little bit about bringing in those different perspectives and those different voices from the community and getting that kind of, those feedback loops going. How, bearing in mind, you know, this is a brilliantly diverse panel, yay. Um, but we know even gender representation is nowhere near where it should be. How do we bring in these diverse communities? How do we welcome them in so they can be those creators? How, you know, so that, you know, we want to get to a point where diverse is the normal, but it isn't there yet. So what do you think we can do going forward to make those spaces to encourage that talent and that creativity, but that's in a way that people are kind of not being dragged into it, but are running to it? Uh, Anna, I'm going to come to you first. Um, so I think for me, I'm always thinking about, okay, how can I improve recruitment for Toya? And, and posting a, our job descriptions in the dev forum in Roblox that allows every community member to apply as a, is, is a step forward for me. And we pay a lot of attention to how we define the role and leave it as open as we can, um, as well as you know, emphasize diversity and inclusion to make our jobs feel more accessible for those who may not consider themselves eligible candidates. So for me, it's like, okay, so how do we make everyone, even the ones that are, they so want to apply, but they won't unless we really facilitate this. So let's give it another thought and, and make it accessible for everyone who can be a brilliant game designer, but is not on our team yet. So I, this is something I'm focusing on all the time when recruiting, yes. Thank you. Um, Ashley, I think, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but also thinking about, you know, that slightly younger audience that you're probably looking for within Roblox. Right. What, yeah. what do you think really works for them for, you know, um, kind of underrepresented groups in, in within the youth sort of sector? What do you think is engaging with them? Um, I mean, well, the biggest way to get someone to participate is actually making them feel as though they're invited. Um, not an outlier or a second thought when it comes to both developing projects and pushing the development environment on aspiring creators. 
we often lose people from the latter, either hostile development or one that doesn't care to consider or accommodate for issues of people like us trying to get into the space. As I mentioned earlier, there are plenty of harmful practices made in the game development industry, making it especially impossible for neurodiverse and disabled individuals to get pretty far, something that can often be remedied with basic consideration. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, Robin, I would just like to add, yeah, I was just gonna say that like one of the biggest things that's happened as a, as a result of COVID is that we have permission to let people work in their environments at home where they're comfortable. It's really, yes. really common for, uh, you know, people that are on the Asperger's or autism spectrum, for example, to really struggle with being in a shared office space where there are a lot of uncontrollable smells and noises um, and, um, and interruptions. Um, and being at home in your own space where you have control over your space, if you're differently abled, having the accessible technology that you already have, being able to, to purchase that and send it to people and having a, a wave of people realizing, oh, I need to actually have an ergonomic setup. I need to be able to uh, get away from my computer for breaks because I have to do child care. You know, there's been a huge conversation as a result of COVID around accessibility. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. When I first founded Phenomena here in San Francisco and was looking for an office space, I found it almost impossible to find a building that was affordable, that had ADA compliant um, you know, uh, uh, entryways, that was accessible to someone who might have a wheelchair. And it just was like, okay, well, if we can't build a wheelchair accessible office space on a budget, if we can't find a place then we'll just we'll just have a work from home policy that if we hire you and you and you can't get access to the space we'll have a work from home policy but then it generated this huge conversation well like what does it mean to be the person as as Ashley is saying who isn't at the office and like how do you create a sense of well-being and inclusion for people that can't be in the physical office that you know was 10 years ago basically um when i look back at that conversation now i can remember signing the lease that said if someone complains about this it's your responsibility to fix it it's not the landlord's responsibility. There's legal terminology in the leases that essentially offshore a lot of these accessibility issues. So when we were able to afford a large office, the very first thing we did was look for something that was accessible, street level, all the bathrooms, everything. Um, it's hard for people who are starting out to instantiate the rules and the spaces that they want to, because in many ways there are financial or legal barriers. And so it's just really important to continue to broaden this conversation as a community and to make demands of the wider community, the rental communities, for example, in your city, um, to really step up and, and meet these concerns um, where we're working and also to be able to have those conversations in your team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, if there is any kind of silver lining to COVID, it's obviously been horrific for everybody. Yes. Um, and the impact is felt you know, globally on all generations. But we know particularly, you know, people who already have these sort of difficulties feel isolated. It's been really, really difficult. Young people we know have really, really struggled with it. Um, you know, hopefully we're going to start heading back in the right direction. But as I say, if there is a silver lining, it was kind of a leveler all those people who'd been told, no, you must be in the office nine to five, you know, no, we can't support work from home. Well, they're going to really struggle with that argument now. And diversely, we know that there are some people because of their sort of isolation, they need the partnerships and the working face to face with people. So hopefully there'll be a balance and we can accommodate what people need, that kind of individual um, packages for people and really respecting their different needs that is what inclusivity is about isn't it is again it's not about saying well if you're in a wheelchair this is what you get it's about that individual person and what support they need so yeah I think that's it's a really important topic to look at that um I was just coming to you Robin to just say about you know particularly around um you know any trends that you've been seeing recently around how we bring in these underrepresented groups so obviously you talked a little bit about physical disabilities um what about kind of the representation stuff more broadly? Have you seen anything new that you think is worth sharing? Yeah, I, so, so Phenomena is what's called a deliberately developmental organization, uh, a DDO. Uh, there's a paper um, on it. Uh, there's free literature on it, actually, on the internet through the Harvard Business Review. Um, and you can look it up, de Deliberately Developmental Organization. There's also a really great book called An Everyone Culture, which is about building communities of practice 
around the concept of your edge or how you're developing. Um, and the, the core concept of the practice is essentially that everyone at the company from the CEO down recognizes that they're um, a person that has a complicated life, that things happen, that they don't know the answer to everything, that sometimes they make mistakes and need to be corrected and need feedback, but also that they welcome that feedback because it helps them grow. And if you build an organization with this kind of seed of being vulnerable and bringing your full self to the office, it leads to a lot of other knock-on effects. For example, um, the concept of having to be at an office from say 10 a.m to 5 p.m. Um, has its own structural ideas. And being able to say, I'm really struggling this week. I'm going to take a couple of extra days off. No questions asked. Everyone on the team will move around that person and figure out how to deal with their tasks so that that person can get the, the space and the time they need to be mentally well, or I'm dealing with a, a health issue at home or whatever. Um, the more you, you surface those needs, which are just human needs in work culture, the better your work culture is and the more supportive it is for a variety of people. So that's one way to do it. And then the other thing I think that I've seen a lot recently, especially in the academic space, is the inclusion of a diversity, equity, and, and like anti-racism statement in any job application, which says, please outline your experience with the, these issues, how you're affecting those issues in your work and what your aspirations are in the space. Reading that ahead of uh, taking the rest of the resume in, and then um, also anonymizing the resume as much as possible, removing uh, identifiers from the resume that would otherwise bias you about the experience in the resume. If you read the diversity statement first and make call, a call of the resumes based on that, and then read these anonymized resumes, you get a very diverse pool and actually, it's exceptionally helpful because it's very easy to spot language in the diversity statements that's talking the talking points, but not really walking them. And I think that that practice has been really helpful to me. Um, and my colleagues at school have really educated me quite a bit on the ways in which there's just so much unconscious bias in the way that we hire. And so I think those two things have really been, have been structurally, re you know, reformative and transformative for me. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and even, you know, I'm just thinking back to the kind of age old issues, trying to get women into these kind of workforces. So we still hear that when they're getting options at school of which topics they're gonna do for their exams, they're still pushing girls towards the caring and the nursing and all of those lovely soft skills. Um, definitely, you know, when, when people wanna do proper STEM subjects, they kind of, well, are you sure? Is that, what, what are you thinking you're gonna do? Um, and so it's really disappointing that I still regularly hear those conversations are happening. But then even in the workplace, as you say, flexibility, whatever, whether it is a childcare, whether it is, you know, as you say, sickness or I'm just not coping today. I just don't want to come in. We should all respect that and support that. Um, if we're hiring good quality people and we trust them, then we should be providing that as a standard. So. It's a shame that we're even having to have that bit of the conversation, but here we are. I also actually saw a wonderful example this morning on a call. I had a, a call with some colleagues, safety colleagues in Australia at the Safety Commissioner's Office. Um, and as I was just scrolling through the website, um, they have a beautiful statement, which I'll just read a little bit of it. But eSafety acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. And then there's a little bit of a content warning on there because it's something that would be, you know, highly offensive and, and upsetting for people should they see the content. And I just thought that was so sensitive, so subtle. It's not like a big poppy, you know, pop up in the middle of the screen and no shouty. It's just there. It's subtle. But it just felt very respectful to me, very inclusive. And yeah, just, I was really pleased that it just happened today and, and we were able to talk about it. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really great example. But yeah, thank you. I think, you know, some some really interesting points for us to think about and to keep building and iterating on that. Definitely. So, OK, we're going to turn a little bit into the tricky stuff. We're talking about the positive st positives and what, what we're trying to do now. What are some of the barriers to creating really inclusive spaces? From my experience, a lot of people get it really, really wrong. Um, so I'm gonna come to you first, Ashley. Do you have any thoughts on this? Why, why it's so hard for some people? Why does it go wrong? Um, well, 
As for some of the biggest barriers, um, most definitely the community. As gaming hasn't been accessible in the past, it's attracted a largely unaccepting and even harmful community. Um, we have a long while to go before we can truly say that the game, that the gaming community is accepting in various different ways. Um, one of the biggest issues I've seen, especially among developers on the Roblox platform who are often quite new to the field, is a lack of, of appreciation for well-established and reliable accessibility guidelines like um, WCAG and the like. Even this, something as simple as text contrast goes ignored. That's a lot of people here are already excluding and alienating as a result. Um, another one is usage of inclusive language. Um, two commonly mistaken examples is the usage of he or she um, instead of they, which which could um, include a lot more um, gender identities and populations and stuff like that, or you know, for um, profession for profession uh, descriptions like people use fireman and policeman. Well you know, alternate terms, much more inclusive ones would be firefighter or police officer instead of having them all um, gendered in some way. When, when an adult, you should consult others. Uh, talking to people who experience issues firsthand is much better than completely approaching them on your own. Not doing this allows a larger risk of either grossing risk representation misrepresenting the populations you're attempting to be mindful of or making matters worse. Yeah, fantastic. You raised some brilliant points there, Ashley. And, uh, you know, I think platforms all over are guilty of quite a lot of those. And again, you know, the, the gendering of job roles. I mean, again, it's just, it's back to that point. We are still bringing up small children using that terminology. You'd really think we would have, right. we would have moved forward. But, and, and people are really resistant. People, you know, when we hear the snowflakes and all of these sorts of things being thrown around, because yeah. people are offended that you don't want to call it a policeman. You know, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, we really need to push for change, I think, in these areas. And that, is there anything you could add about the barriers? Why, why do people get it so wrong all the time? You know, sometimes people are afraid of what they do not know. And it's about communication, mostly. So they wouldn't really have the basic tools for communicating with others that are not, that doesn't seem to them like they are so different. So it starts from there, I think, and from thinking within my team anyway, there are some times where we are having lunch and there are like funny conversations happening because some of the worlds are so different, fundamentally different from each other. So how do I accept that? How can I feel comfortable to share who I am and be accepted by others? And so I think that, you know, it's about developing the communication tools within your team, within your family, with your children, where you're yes. living. So it's about that, I think. This is the shift that needs to occur in order for us to feel comfortable and for it to become like a non-issue. So I think that it's, like, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but if we start with small baby steps, then for me, it's like, okay, let's figure out what would be the best tools for communicating and let's find the things that are common and, and that we can collaborate on. So I think that one of the things we love to do in the team with the remote, but also with the, you know, the Israeli-based team is to play. We like to play together. So every week someone chooses a game, we all hop in and we play for an hour, an hour and a half and we talk while we play and it's like fantastic. And it, it brings out so much of, you know, who you are and what you like to do and what happened to you today. And so this makes people feel much more closer. So, you know, perfecting those tools of communication uh, can be really helpful. I love that, that kind of play therapy is one that yes. we know, you know, <clears throat> is often used within and the childcare and, and literally in therapy is, 
you don't sit down across a desk from a young person and get them to talk about their issues. You go for a walk, you take them for a drive, you do something totally different and you're going to get a really different response and just for that sure. relaxed, comfortable conversation. And I love that as an idea for a team. I am definitely taking that back to my team. We're long overdue some playtime together. Robin, is there anything you can add around the barriers? Why is it, why is it so hard for people? I think, you know, one of the more, more, more recent books that I read that I really enjoyed um, is a book called Braiding Sweet, Sweetgrass by another Robin, Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's a, um, an indigenous plant scientist um, who's actually born and raised in the same area that I grew up in, upstate New York in the Great Lakes region. Um, and uh, I think that one of the, the best things about her book, which is a series of essays around different topics, but always focusing on sort of sustainability, the environment, and the ways in which we engage with the planet, is that there are really, really different ways to approach the concept of authority, the concept of knowing, and the concept of having. Like in the cultures that have colonized the planet for the most part, there's this performance of authority, performance of knowing, performance of structural power that we unconsciously take on. And what she does is in a really beautiful and poetic way, because she's also a poet, um, is, is, is unpack some of the language, the scientific language around plants you know, categorizing objects, thinking about species, our relationship with species. Um, and one of the one of the most interesting things in the book is this concept of the honorable harvest, which is that her people in the original sort of configuration that they found themselves growing up in the world um, had a practice of whenever they went someplace and found something like, let's say, mushrooms or sweet grass that you could harvest. You never take the first thing you find. You ask before you take anything. So you, you sit and you sit with the place and say, is it okay for me to have some of this? You leave half and you leave it better than you found it. So if you find a place, for example, to set up camp, you set up camp on a river. When you leave, you leave a bundle of firewood where you had a fire to welcome the next person that will find that place. And the idea is that animals and people live in this space together. And the idea of the honorable harvest is that even if other humans don't eat the mushrooms, perhaps a deer will, <laughs> perhaps perhaps a little raccoon will. And that deer or raccoon or whoever is living in that space is part of the structures and the systems that make that place sustainable. And I think when, when I listen to Anat talking about this or Ashley talking about this idea of, of the fundamental lack of inclusion, what I always hear beneath these things is the performance of authority, the performance of knowing. And that vulnerability that you get in a team when you have you know, lunch and learns about different cultural food practices or like a donut meetup where you just meet with a random person, have a donut and talk, even through the pandemic, these kinds of things that we've instituted at Phenomena, they're about letting go of this notion of authority and really being yeah. just a person in a space. And I think that her book is really good at sort of unpacking how deeply and structurally this idea of authority, power, having, owning is part of our as part of our approach as as, as sort of a western influenced culture mm -hmm. and it's a really good thing to sort of to ask yourself on a daily basis what you have what you own and what you think you know yeah i think that idea of kind of nurture is really interesting and i'm i'm fascinated i actually had a conversation only yesterday with a really close friend and they had this idea that humans are the custodians of the planet and that we are here to just help along the life cycle and that we shouldn't actually impact it we're just there to nurture and to support so I'm, I'm absolutely loving that idea and that really does apply not just with wildlife and flora it and flora, applies to but teams right if you think of yourself people. as enabling yeah, a team you know that's how I say it so beautifully yeah. Um, totally. do no harm um so I, we've only got a very short while left so I'm going to kind of speed through this I'm going to ask one question about collaboration um, so we know, you know, this is part of the um, Fair Play Alliance Summit. So, you know, we know bringing industry together can create wonderful, wonderful things, sharing best practices. Um, I know that uh, Raising Good Gamers, for example, are doing some fantastic work as well, um, bringing industry voices together and looking at kind of how collaborations, sharing tools and all sorts of things on this. Do you guys know of other projects or organizations who are really doing that stuff um, and what does good cross-industry collaboration really look like I'll start with you again Robin 
Um, I would actually just say that the Fair Play Alliance is, is, is a perfect example of, you know, a motivated group of people really trying. I think the AIIS, um, Megan Scavio has been really leading that community, uh, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, to do more work uh, sponsoring women, people of color, queer and trans folks in breaking in at the, at the executive level. So, you know, inviting them to DICE and giving them exposure to business development practices, which I think we need to do interventions at the top of the food chain in addition to the bottom. And then the third one I'll mention is, is the One Up Fund, uh, which is run by Ed Fries, who, who was the founder of the Xbox. Um, he's built a really inclusive and, and amazing pr uh, process-oriented investment fund that supports, uh, that supports developers from a variety of walks of life in a way that's really compelling. And I think that as we continue to grow the industry and more people make money, we'll see funds and sponsorship coming from more diverse people. And that's when we'll truly see the way that Ashley and her colleagues deserve, you know, is when people who've made it are also from these groups and sponsoring them to continue to develop. Pay it forward, <laughs> very much. And that, is there anything you want to add to this point? What are you seeing? Oh, sure, I think, you know, Robin said it so well. <laughs> yes. Perfect, okay, so we have three questions for wrapping up. So what are the opportunities of building in a metaverse I, um, space? Um, I think, you know, the opportunities are like endless. Um, I, we at Toya, I think we buy into Dave's vision of creating whole new economies on the platform. Uh, we see the platform as a very accessible and constructive place that can create financial opportunities and jobs and even new careers for many young people across a number of fields. And I think that, you know, also being here on the platform in the early days of real world brands and IPs coming onto Roblox is also an incredible opportunity and responsibility. I think it means we can influence the way that brands participate and create greater, you know, inclusion and acceptance and, and like really align with the core values of the platform, like around creativity and accessibility and inclusion and fun. So being a part of that, like helping big brands build themselves and bringing them in as an opportunity to rewrite the narrative. This is how I see it. It really is. And I'm so pleased, Anna, you used the word fun. This has been very weighty topics. We talked about all that serious stuff, but ultimately we want to create experiences and places that are fun for everybody. We want them to have yeah. a good time when they're hanging out, as well as all of this representation. Yes. OK, we have our last couple of minutes, so I am going to just ask this question. Ashley, I would love to come back to you on this, if it's OK. What advice would you give to the next generation of young game developers for building content? Um, as next generation of game developers, your number one goal should be to accommodate for the next generation of gamers. I, so, uh, so it's perfect. I think that you summed it up in one line. Um, Robin, Anna, just a, a one line on that. Do you have thoughts? Um, I really believe that actually bringing your full self to whatever creative activity you do is so important. Really learning to have the confidence to speak from your experience and, and building and building things that reflect that experience is the best way, especially with games, to give other people an opportunity to identify with you, to empathize with you, and to experience your perspective. Wonderful. Thank you. Anna? I don't think I have anything to add. I think I just want Okay, I'm going to throw the last question to you then. If you had a crystal ball, what do you think the next big development in terms of inclusion and representation and how we embrace diversity. What do you think is gonna be the next big thing? Um, I, I think that when it comes that we would not need to discuss that any longer. So no one would know who you are and you can be, you can really be what you wanna be. That's the next step for me, next phase, yes. I'm so looking forward to that. And that for me is the perfect wrap up. Thank you so much for being on the panel today. It's been a fantastic conversation. I'm sure everyone's going to really enjoy it. Thank you all so much.